печально он такой, что снова я повторяю, как же мне хуёво. Deterrence is the art of producing in the mind of the enemy the fear to attack. Swept to power on the back of a wave of instability, Alexander Dubček had been the former leader of Slovakia, was raised in the Soviet Union and spoke fluent Russian. His appointment had been met with approval by both the people of Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union, and on assuming office he used his popularity to set about a series of sweeping and radical reforms. His aim was to put a human face on communism. Travelling restrictions in and out of the country were lifted, but most contentious of all, he abolished state censorship on the media. Freedom of speech meant that people could finally talk openly about their dissatisfaction with the communist system. It wasn't long before Dubček found himself at loggerheads with the leader of the Soviet Union, Leonard Brezhnev, and he was summoned to the Kremlin, where he was told in no uncertain terms that he was going to have to roll back some of his reforms. The need for reform was generally accepted among the leaders of the Soviet Union, but the pace of Dubček's reforms made many leading figures in the Communist Party deeply uncomfortable. First and foremost of their demands was that he re-implement state censorship on the media. Meanwhile, the countries of the Warsaw Pact were reminded that as good communists, it was their duty to do anything necessary in order to maintain the communist project, even if that meant taking military action. Dubček refused. He saw Czechoslovakia as a sovereign nation whose involvement in the communist project was entirely voluntary, and he felt that his reforms were necessary to save communism in the eyes of the public. I believe you're fighting for something, for more than your survival? Can you tell me what it is? Do you even know? Is it freedom or truth? Perhaps peace? Could it be for love? On the 20th of August 1968, at the height of the Cold War, the rest of the world looked on helplessly as Soviet tanks rolled through the streets of the Golden City. The invading armies were met with no resistance, as Dubček had ordered his military to stand down. That said, the people of Prague were not going to take the invasion laying down. The tanks were met by thousands of unarmed protesters, who saw an invading army trying to abolish their hard-won rights for no good reason at all. Because at the time of the invasion, both the leadership and the population of Czechoslovakia were still very much in favour of the communist system. But for all the protestations, the small nation was no obstacle for the might of the Red Army, and ultimately Dubček would be arrested and Czechoslovakia would be brought back under the close control of the Kremlin's central authority. The forces of darkness and the treasonable maggots who collaborate with them must, can and will wiped from the face of the earth. We must crush them. We must smash them. We must stamp them out. We, the people of Oceania, and our traditional allies, the people of Eurasia, will not rest until the final victory has been achieved. Death to the eternal enemy of Oceania. Death! Due to the strict censorship of the media, the world would come to know the invasion through the lens of an anonymous theatre photographer signing off on the pseudonym PP for Prague Photographer. The fear for his safety was such that he smuggled his films out in secret, as anyone caught speaking negatively about the Soviet Union was sure to face arrest and possibly death. That said, the sheer raw power of his images meant they found their way to New York and eventually to the wider world. And although nobody knew who the mysterious PP was, his images would go on to be featured in the pages of some of the most prominent newspapers in the world. When the Times ran his images, Joseph Kudalka was working in London, and he remarked on the strange feeling of seeing his photographs published, but being unable to tell anyone that they were his. Little did he know, but his negatives had found their way to the prestigious Magnum Photo Agency, which was headed up at the time by Elliot Irwin, who took a personal interest in them and was desperate to find out if there were any more, and who would later go on to help Kudalka become a member. But fame for Kudalka was a double-edged sword. As the popularity of his images grew, so did the threat of Soviet reprisals against him and his family. Eventually, opting to live in exile in London, 
a theme that would carry through into his later works. It wasn't until his father's death in 1985 that Joseph Kudelka would finally become known publicly as the Prague photographer. Is it safe? Yes, it's safe. It's very safe. It's so safe you wouldn't believe it. Is it safe? Characterised by a keen eye for exceptional composition and a flair for the dramatic, it's easy to see why Kudelka's images have had such a lasting impact on the world of photography. With the bravery of ten men, he didn't shy from getting right in amongst the action, despite being fully aware of the consequences if he was caught. His desire to display the human cost of war could only be achieved by getting up close and personal with all of his subjects. Looking at his images, it's clear to see why a state obsessed with controlling its media messaging wouldn't want to see the release of photographs that might generate sympathy for what they saw as traitors to the Communist Party. With no time to prepare, Kudelka grabbed whatever equipment he had to hand. A wide-angle lens and fast film. Whilst the graininess of fast film may not be typically desirable, I can't help but feel they add something to the aesthetic in the same token as Robert Kappa's D-Day landing photographs. You have one relationship to this media. You draw one conclusion. We might draw another. Death of the author. The question is, are you being authentic? Well, I don't think I'm being deceptive. But when you're assessing a work of art for truth, whether emotional or otherwise, it's not just about that. It can also be about how much pleasure somebody takes in viewing it. And that can be the key that makes them curious about the rest. We're not really bothered about your theories of art here, matey. We're here about the truth. With no formal journalistic training and an immense personal proximity to the events taking place, I think it's pertinent to ask questions about Kudelka's objectivity. Kudelka, very open about his lack of journalistic training, said simply that he was a photographer who knew that these events were important and needed photographing, which leaves wide open the possibility that in his mind he was creating a piece of art as opposed to a piece of reportage. However, these questions shouldn't be misinterpreted as an attack on Kudelka's authenticity. As Pablo Picasso's Guernica painting is abstract in the extreme, but is still regarded as legitimate in the historical record as an accurate representation of the pain and devastation felt that day. Examining Kudelka's work has taught me sometimes art can be a better representation of the truth than actual reportage, and sometimes that's okay. <laughs>